some of you probably were here two weeks ago for the first session on sequencing, just introduction to the next gen sequencing. Uh, and I, I did that lecture two, two weeks ago. But you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about whether you went to that first session because you know, it's totally like a standalone uh, by itself. So, so it's okay if you didn't come. But obviously, you know, that was just introduction sequencing. Today we're going to focus on the RN sequencing specifically. And the reason we focus on RN sequencing is just because, you know, this is probably the most commonly uh, used sequencing applications, uh, particularly for academic labs. You know, industry probably you know, are talking about exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, uh, but here at Stanford, I don't think many labs are doing whole genome sequencing uh, for many, many different samples. Right? But typically, they're probably talking about you know, RN sequencing, you know, chipsick, you know, clipsick, you know, these type of uh, uh, more research oriented uh, sequencing. So, so before I start, you know, can I, you know, have your hands just showing, you know, how many people are doing RNA sequencing? All right, how many of you plan to do RNA sequencing? Oh, okay, that's pretty much what I, what I thought. Okay. So, so hopefully today you're going to learn something about the sort of practical guidance uh, on RNA sequencing. Um, so we're not going to get into lots of tiny details, but hopefully you have some ideas, and then you're going to learn some sort of important tips of RNA sequencing. All right. So you know, for RNA, of course, we know that in the cell, there's a nucleus. You know, everything kind of start, you know, starts in the nucleus. And the DNA transcribes into the pre-mRNA, and then the pre-mRNA is spliced and you know other processing, and then it will become a mature mRNA, and then mature mRNA will be exported into the cytosol that can be translated. Right, that's pretty much the fate of RNA. Oh. Oh. Sorry. So, of course, you know, here you've probably all seen this, some version of this before, right? So you have this is the DNA, you have exons, introns, exon, intron, and that will be, you know, trans transcribed again, you know, into, into this pre-MRA, and then you have exons, introns, exons, introns, and then the introns will be spliced away, and there's a capping, and also the, the polyadenylation, right? So you have this uh, mature MRA. And you know that's pretty much often people try to sort of capture in the sequencing, right? So you can do you know RNA sequencing, or sometimes you have small RNA sequencing, and also some applications can even do you know, five prime end sequencing so that you can capture where the transcription starts. And sometimes uh, there are you know alternative polyadenylation. You really want to capture different uh, and sort of isoforms of polyadenylation tails, right? So you can try to sequence specifically for the three prime end tails. Uh, probably the most common uh, uh, application is just a mature MR sequencing. Right, so why do we need that? Just very quickly, you know, you're probably all familiar with, of course, we want to measure gene expression levels, we want to measure splicing, alternative splicing. You know, sometimes you don't want to identify some genetic variants in the RNA, because RNA does give you that information. Uh, and of course, you know, by doing RNA sequencing, you can identify new genes and even new exomes, uh, which is actually not something sort of conventional microarray methods can deliver, right? Because microarrays, you have to kind of base on something you know, and you, you kind of design probes uh, so that you can, uh, 
you, you, can, you can measure uh, the expression of known genes or known exons. And of course, we can measure the, the, the three point contamination and the five prime capping, et cetera. There, there's just so many different applications. Right? So then, in terms of protocols, uh, the, the first thing you have to understand is that when you try to sequence the RNA, you typically are thinking about sequencing the mRNA. But when you extract the RNA from a cell, from a tissue, you're extracting the total RNA, which is a lot, right? But then when you think about total RNA, you have to, you have to know that the vast majority of the total RNA is not mRNA, right? Only a small fraction, often maybe 2 to 5% of the total RNA is mRNA. So the rest, uh, the vast majority uh, is the ribosome RNA, which is super abundant but also very boring, m nobody really cares about, right? So you don't want to sequence the ribosome RNA. If you don't you know, really ext extract the mRNA for your sequencing, you're wasting more than 95% of your reads dedicated to something like ribosome RNA, which you don't care at all, right? So, so that's something to keep in mind, right? And then you know, to sequence this, you know, sort of, you have to sort of remove the ribosome RNA. There are many different ways of doing that. You know, one way is some sort of positive selection. You, you select the poly A plus RNA, which is sort of the feature of, of MRAs for sequencing. There are some methods for that. We'll get to that in a second. And the other is so-called sort of negative removal, right? So you basically remove things you don't want. In this case, the ribosome RNAs. You remove the ribosome RNA, and then you only keep uh, the, you know, the non sort of ribosome RNA, uh, other species of RNA for sequencing. And of course, there are three prime, five prime sequencing, and also small RNA sequencing. All right, so, so one thing, before I start, I do, wanna, do want you to understand, you know, RNA sequencing seems complicated, but after all, you know, RNA sequencing is just like DNA sequencing. You know, in this case, we're not sequencing the RNA directly, okay? So although there, there are some companies trying to develop methods to do direct RNA sequencing, which will be very cool, by the way, uh, but so far, you know, no one is really talking about direct sequen RNA sequencing. We're talking about sequencing the CDNA which is a copy of the RNA, right? So essentially, we're sequencing the DNA as well, right? But there's just a one extra step before you sequence that DNA, which is to convert the RNA to DNA, which is something you know, we're all familiar with, right? So, so don't panic, right, first of all, when you do RNA sequencing, because pretty much every step is something you may be familiar with if you've done molecular biology, right? Because it's just so conventional. You've probably done RT-PCR, right? From CDNA RNA to CDNA, to PCR, but in this case, you convert RNA to CDNA and then sort of make that into a sequencing library. That's it. That's essentially you know, what you're trying to achieve, right? So, so then the, the question, of course, you, know, just, you, have, you just have to make the CDN first. That's an extra step you know, in addition to the conventional the DNA sequencing protocol I mentioned uh, two weeks ago, right? So it's a very simple idea. We have some, you know, typically, let's think about the genomic DNA for a second, right? There's a genomic DNA you want to sequence. Typically, what you need to do is just fragment that genomic DNA and then ligate with some adapters. You know, I use something called wide shift adapter so that you can basically ligate that and then you can make a library in the end so that you have this gray area uh, of interest that you want to sequence. But on both ends, you have sort of different, ada different adapters and then you can use this common adapter sequences to sequence from this end. Sometimes the pair end sequencing, you can sequence from the other end. Right? That's how you do the sequencing. But for RNA sequencing, again, you're pretty much going to do the same thing. But in addition, in the upstream of this step, you're going to have to figure out ways to make the double-stranded CDN, right? Because you start with RNA. Right? That's as simple as that. All right. So then, how do you how do you, you know, really kind of start with the, with a the total RNA, and how do you get from the total RNA to the double-stranded CDN, right? That's essentially what we're focus we're trying to focus on now. Right, so, so like I said, there are different ways of removing the ribosome RNA. So one way is this sort of se positive selection, right? You're specifically capturing, you know, poly plus RNA. You know, one way to do that is just, you know, you have, you know, there's, a, there's, there's some magnetic beads coated with the oligo DT, uh, you know, on these beads, so that you can, oligo DT and poly A, <coughs> what you reverse complementary to each other, you can capture these poly plus RNA specifically. And then you know, uh, another way to do that is you actually can just use oligo DT as a primer when you do RT, right? Because once you have an RA, you have the reverse transcription, right? 
So you know, there are many different ways of doing re re reverse transcription, but in this case, you could try to use the oligo DT oligos as a primer so that you can specifically you know, select the poly plus RNA to reverse transfer. Right. Right, so, so for the first, you know, to capture the poly A plus RNA is pretty straightforward. So this is a sort of magnetic B, right? So you, you, you call it uh, with uh, oligo DT. I just wrote one, but you can imagine there's like a multiple on this B, multiple oligo DT on this B, and then you can capture all these poly A. Uh, a poly, uh, poly A plus RNA. So basically, you have this because it's magnetic, you can kind of reach for this and then you can elute the, the RNA uh, from the speed uh, eventually. And I'm not going to get into detail, but you know, conceptually, it's very, very straightforward. And, and the other approach I mentioned is I can use oligo DT as a primer for the uh, reverse transcription, right? So typically, you, know, you have this RNA you start with. And it's very straightforward, right? You can have this oligo DT, usually it's 12 to 18 bases long, so that this oligo DT can anneal to this poly A part. And then you know, during RT, reverse transcription, you can make the, you know, the first strand CDN, right? You're probably all familiar with that. And then you, know, you can have even like a full end a CDN mRNA hybrid sequence. And after you have that, uh, you can use you know, things like RNH, so that you can, RNH will specifically cut RNA when uh, it's in the RNA-DNA hybrid. Right? So you'll make cuts sort of randomly in the, in the RNA, and then use uh, E. coli polymerase 1 that will basically use the, the remnants of RNA fragments as a primer, in a way, so that you can use the first band CDN as a template and use this piece as a primer so that you can make uh, the other strand, which is the second strand, CDN. Right? So that's how you kind of make the, make the double strand and CDN, which is something people developed decades ago, right? You know, particularly in the old days when people try to clone some genes, right? You have some long gene, you have to, to really make the full end CDN so that you can, you, can, you, can, you can make the double strand CDN, you clone to some vectors, right? So by having that, uh, right, then you can use some ligase to even ligate everything together so that would that way you can have sort of full end double stranded CDN. You know, in in theory, this is great, right? Because by doing that, you actually have a full end uh, double stranded CDN. But we know this is actually very challenging because you know usually the RT is not as precessive as you would hope. You know, particularly the genes, most of the genes are pretty long. Even for MRAs, we're talking about five KB or, or even longer yeah. on average, right? So it's actually very hard for the RT to go from the very end of the transcripts, the poly tail, to the very beginning of the transcripts. So that is a real problem. You know, as a result, uh, often when you make libraries using this type of approach, you're going to have a huge uh, three time bias towards towards end because you kind of you know prime at the very three time end, right? So then, you know, the chance is that you know you're not going to get to the very beginning, the very five time end of the RNA. So that means you're going to more and more for the three time ends. But that's something people, some people still use, but in general, this, this is not very commonly used, you know, unless you want to really achieve some full end CDN. All right, so instead, uh, all right, so after you, sorry, after you have that, again, what you need to do is so now you have this, uh, you know, the, the full end CDN, and of course you can fragment it, just like the way you treat the genomic DNA, right? And then you have this genomic, this, this DNA, you fragment it, you can make a sequencing library. Then essentially that's RNA sequencing now. It's not called genome sequencing, right? But again, it's very similar. Right, so this is probably the most commonly used uh, protocol for RNA sequencing, and not the, the oligo DT priming uh, approach I just mentioned, because there's a huge three prime man uh, bias, right? So the way it, you know, this works is that you know, the first step, you, you basically fragment uh, or shatter the RNA into very small pieces, right? You know, there are there, there are different protocols. By the way, there are many different kits I, I'm going to mention in the end. You don't have to worry about all the details because the kits now can tell you a lot of things, but I do encourage you to understand the principle behind the kits. That's sort of the, the idea here okay, in this course. Right, so you have, you know, the kits basically you just, you know, treat the RNA usually with heat or some base buffer. So basically, if you have, you know, sodium hydroxide with heat, when the RNA is usually pretty fragile, under this condition, it's even more fragile, right? So then you can sort of control the time of the heat, 
how, how much time you want to heat up the RNA in, in that phase, right? So then you can control the size of the fragments, right? Because sometimes you do care about the size of the fragments, particularly if you want to do parent sequencing, because when you have these fragments, eventually these fragments will be made into libraries so that you can sequence from this end and that end, right? So for that reason, and also the sequence in real end is often 100 or 150, right? You don't want to have the fragments that are too short, right? Because otherwise, you're just like 100, you're kind of, kind of waste, right? You have to sequence from both ends, right? So usually the size in practice uh, ranges from maybe 300 to 500 in phases, right? So again, you can control that, the size range uh, by the timing uh, you know, under that heat uh, in, in, in the phase condition. All right, so you fragment RA, uh, which is pretty much random, and then you just use random hexamers. You know, you've probably all done this uh, RT-PCR. You should just use random hexamers. So basically, there's six nucleotide now, uh, DNA oligo, that will pretty much randomly anneal to the RA, right? And when this, you know, random hexamer anneals to the RA, of course, you can make, uh, you can make the first strand CDN first, and then, of course, you can make the double strand CDN. Uh, CDN, which I'm not getting into the details, right? Just not what I just mentioned earlier, right? So that's how you make that. You make this type of libraries. And by doing that, uh, of course, then after you have this DNA, it's already fragmented, right? So you just, you basically, this already sort of fragmented DNA, although in this case, it's a fragmented CDN, right? You just make your sequencing library. Right? That's, that's very, very straightforward, right? You all follow me? Because, right? you know, that was, Sort of the most common protocol uh, you definitely want to understand. Right, so, so maybe, you know, because some of you didn't come last time, and, and also I, I do think this is actually very important to understand you know, how enormous sequencing works. So maybe I, we can just spend one or two more minutes so that I can quickly describe how you would do sequencing, right? Because remember, in the last step here, you have this library you want to sequence. This is a, this is a gray insert library that you want to sequence. There are just many different <coughs> inserts you want to sequence, right? So no matter what sequence, uh, what insert you have in the middle, you have common sequences here, and you have common sequences here, right? So one thing I want to introduce you is that no matter what sequencing library you make, RNA sequencing, whole genome sequencing, chip sequencing, clip sequencing, whatever sequencing library you want to make, you always have something called P5 on one end, you have P7 on the other end, right? So basically these are just two common sequences. They're just their names, doesn't matter how they're called. Right? One common sequence here, the other common sequence here, right? The reason you always have these common sequences is, is just because when you do sequencing, uh, you know not sequencing, on the flow cell or the chip you put the DNA onto uh, for sequencing, on this chip you always have two oligos sort of standing, standing on, right? One is P7, the other is P5, okay? Or the P7 prime, P5 prime. Uh, so then when you have the oligo, the, sorry, this library flowing into the flow cell, and here I just draw one particular molecule, just a single molecule, right? You flow into that flow cell, the first thing you do is to, to, to basically make another copy, right? Because you can do PCR, and then you know, once that copy is made, you can remove the original copy, right? So then you, this copy will be attached to the surface, right? And then you can do bridge PCR because this rad will be annealed to that part, and then then if you do PCR again, uh, you can, uh, right, then you can do PCR and you can make another copy. And then you can make basically from here, uh, one copy, now you have two copies attached to the surface of the, of, the, of the flow cell, right? And if you keep doing the same thing again and again, you know, basically go back here and then you just keep making more copies. Basically each one of these copy will, will, will be doubled for each cycle. It's pretty much just PCR. That's something called bridge PCR. All right, so after 30, 40 different cycles, usually you have thousands of uh, molecules synthesized, derived from a single molecule that was long gone, right, after the synthesis, right? So that's how, so in Illumina does its sequencing, um, so it's not called single molecule sequencing, but you can imagine it's sort of derived from single molecules, right? But you need to amplify the signal from that single molecule so that you can have a lot more information. Right, so then the rest is that you can basically try to, to get rid of one of the two strands because they're like blue right here and the red blue here. So I'm not going into details anymore. So you get rid of one of that and then you use this red common sequence. You see, 
at the, at the sequencing primer, you go from the top to the bottom, and then you can get the sequence read number one. You can probably typically now get 100 bases uh, uh, in a real, basically a real end, right, from one to 100 on this end. And, and then if you want to sequence from this end, the way you do it, you actually have, you have to figure out ways to kind of invert this molecule upside down, uh, which is something I mentioned last time. You know, just uh, this is probably not super important. Uh, basically, you, you, you sort of have to to make this type of molecule blue red to something red and blue here, okay? So that you can sequence from the other end, uh, so that you can have the read one, the read two sequencing. That's how you achieve pair end sequencing, okay? So that's very important if you want to understand enumla sequencing. I just want to sort of recap that very quickly. All right, so. I guess if you understand what I just said in the past five minutes, you pretty much got the main messages of you know, how to make a regular conventional RNA sequencing library and how the sequencing is done on the Illumina platform. Okay? So the rest is, is more like details, you know, some specific protocols, in a way like tips, right? Why? why? Because you know, you, you're probably often puzzled. There are just so many things flowing there. The sales rep can use this and that, right? So then you have no idea how to compare. Right? So maybe we can just dig into more of that so that you can have an idea why sometimes they hand you something called strength-specific RNA sequencing, why that matters, um, right? And a few other things, right? So let's talk about the strength-specific RNA sequencing. Uh, right, so the, first of all, in the way that they call, the reason they call the strength-specific RNA sequencing is just because in the conventional RNA sequencing, like the one I just described, you fragment the RNA, you make the cDNA, right? So in the end, you actually don't retain the orientation information of the RNA, right? You just sequence, you just make from some RNA, either in this direction or that direction, you will make, you will make the same cDNA because it's double-stranded, right? You don't keep any information of the original orientation of the RNA, right? Based on the protocol I just described uh, a few minutes ago, right? But sometimes that's not sufficient because obviously RNA is oriented. You know, you have five primes to three primes. That information is there. If you can keep that information in your library, in your data, you know, isn't that great, right? Because sometimes, you know, you may not necessarily have the annotation or the right annotation of that gene of interest, right? What I'm saying is that, let's say you have a gene there, the reason you don't care too much about the orientation is because you already know that gene, you know, that's a Watson strand, that's a Crick strand, you know the orientation, how that gene is, is, uh, is transcribed in the genome, right? So when you get the short read from RNA sequencing, you just map that to, to the annotation, annotated genome or transcriptome, you don't care, you don't think too much about whether that's right or wrong, right? In most cases, that's right. But not necessarily all the case, because if you study anti-sense RNA, that will become a huge problem, because you have sense and anti-sense. Your RNA-seq read will not be able to tell you whether your read should be mapped to sense or the anti-sense that are actually derived from the same genomic locus. Does that make sense? So, so that's why the strength-specific RNA sequencing can sort of add on additional information to the conventional RNA sequencing. And the cost of doing that is almost nothing. And we'll get to that. Right, so how do we do that? Right, there are different ways of doing it. You know, in the very beginning, people probably tried to use sort of RNA ligation method, because you can imagine if this is an mRNA, five prime, three prime, right? If you like, like it, one adapter to the three prime end first, and then you add another adapter to the five prime end, different adap adapter to the five prime end, obviously you can make a library with two different adapters that you can distinguish, you know, basically you can use this as a sequencing primer, right? You can distinguish whether a sequencing from five prime or three prime. That's pretty straightforward. But the problem of that is that the RNA ligation, I don't know how many have, have you done, you know, it's not too, too bad, but it's really not the, 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 the best reagent you, know, you want to deal with. It's not like a T4 DNA ligase. Uh, it's also more expensive, it's just harder to deal with. It's, a, it's an RNA ligation. So what's probably more, uh, a lot more common is this protocol, uh, the UTP uh, protocol, and we'll get into details uh, in a second. Right, so essentially, <coughs> you, you, wanna, you wanna have a way to distinguish, you know, remember when you make the 
from Ra, right? You make the first strand CDN and then make the second strand CDN, right? So in this process, if you have a way to distinguish the first strand versus the second strand CDN, that would be very helpful, right? So if you can, you know, tell apart these two different strands, that already tells you the orientation. We'll, we'll get to that. Okay. So the way you do it, again, the same thing. You have Ra fragmented. He makes you know first strand CDN as usual with DNTPs, right? And what's different is that when you make the second strand CDN, uh, you you actually sort of spike in some DUTPs to replace a fraction of the DTTPs, right? So you know basically DUTP and DTTP, you know, in terms of base pairing, will both base pair with DATP, right? So that will not affect the the, the second strand CDN synthesis, but you do introduce something different, which I label in sort of uh, flag dots, right? As D, DUTPs, right? So often you may have you know ten percent of DTTP replaced with DUTPs. So basically, you still have a lot of DTTPs, <coughs> but some of them will become DUTPs. So then the idea is that for each one of the second strand second strand CDN, you want to have a minimum of one DUTP uh, incorporated. Okay, I tell you why only one will be sufficient, right? So okay, so you have this second strand CDNA, which is somewhat labeled with DUTP, right? But the first strand CDNA is not, right? Because the first strand CDNA is is not, but at this point, and then you make a library just like the way uh, you would do, you know, like before, right? So you have this fragmented RA, you just you know, add adapters, you, you, you make libraries for sequencing, just like the regular RNA sequencing, regular non-DNA sequencing, right? So once you, you make this, this is basic adapters, so the Y-shift adapters, ligate it to this double strand in CDA, right? So you have these fragments, and then you add one extra step, that's pretty much the only extra step you add. You know, you add something called D UDG, which is a Eurosol DNA glycosylase. That was specific specifically cut the DNA before, right before and after the DUTP uh, you incorporate into the second strand CDN, right? So, so that means if you have a DUTP here, you basically, you're going to have, with treat, when you treat with UDG, you know, this second strand CDN will be sort of fragmented into at least two pieces, right? If you only have one DUTP incorporated. If you have two, it will be three pieces. So on and so forth, right? So that's why I said you only need one DUTP incorporated because by having that, you're going to destroy the second strand CDN. So that when you do PCR using this sort of common sequence, purple and blue, you're not going to be able to amplify the second strand CDN. You will only be able to amplify the first strand CDN. Okay? And then you can see from here, from the first strand CDN, you know. Let's say this is the five prime end, this is the three prime end. Oh, this is, sorry, this should be five prime end, this should be three prime end. You know, this three prime end is always ligated to something like a blue, right? This is five prime end is always ligated to something like a purple, right? So with the purple and blue sequence, now we can distinguish whether this is from the five prime end or whether this should be the three prime end because you're now only amplifying the DNA derived from the first strand. CDN, not the second strand CDN, right? Because otherwise, if you have a second strand DNA mixed here, so any sequence derived from the, the blue sequencing primer sequencing will be either here or here, right? But now this is not an option anymore, right? Because you destroy that strand. Does that does that make sense? So it sounds more complicated than sort of practical. Uh, Applications because when you do it, that's actually a very simple step uh, to add on, right? Because you know one thing you have to understand when you do RNA sequencing, usually we're talking about forty different steps, right? So there are many, many different steps. So this is actually not too much to add on. I try to simplify a lot of steps because there are a lot of purification steps. So, so by, by having that information, you know some of you may argue I don't care, uh, but I would say this could be a very useful information uh, at some point in your research because you don't rely on the annotation of, of the genes. All right, so, right, so now you have only have that, you just do PCR, you amplify and sequence. You have the orientation from the, to distinguish five versus three prime ends of the original transcripts. All right, so do you guys all follow that? Right. Feel free to, to interrupt. Okay, so that was 
the poly plus mature mRNA sequencing. But in many other applications, you know, people say, oh, you know, my RNA uh, may not be poly plus uh, uh, tail, right? So I want to, you know, sequence all other RNA except the ribosome RNA. I guess very few people care about ribosome RNA. Uh, almost nobody, right? So, so then that's why people want to do so-called total RNA sequencing, but still they want to remove uh, the, the ribosome RNAs, right? So again, why the ribosome, why the poly plus RNA is not satisfactory? Because we know some of the non-coding RNAs, for example, are not poly identity, although many of them are. And we know that there's something called circular RNA. Obviously, there's no tail, right, for these circles. Uh, if you use poly tail uh, approach, here, it's not going to work. And of course, many of the RNA have very low quality, right? Particularly if you deal with like tumor samples, for example, your RNA is often quite fragmented. Right? If you use poly oligo DT to enrich the RNA first, you're basically going to end up with the three prime ends of these RNA because these RNA are fragmented. You know, you're, you use oligo DT, you're not going to get the full end of the RNA, right? Because uh, they're all they're all gone. They're they're just in a different piece. Uh, different molecules, right? That that's also quite important. Uh, that that might be, by the way, that might be the main reason for a lot of applications because uh, you know, RNA quality is often a, a concern, right? So how do we do that? Uh, so obviously we need to remove the ribosomal RNAs uh, from you know from from the libraries. <laughs> there are different ways of doing that. Probably the most commonly used protocol. Uh, you know, in the literature or maybe in the market, uh, is derived from this sort of bead-based approach. Uh, although I personally do not prefer, I, I tell you why in a second. Um, so essentially, they just use some beads coated with oligo DT, okay, to mix with the total RNA you want to sequence, right? And then pull away, uh, you know, sorry, I, I, sorry, not oligo DT. They, <laughs> Go back a little bit, sorry. They use magnetic beads coated with the sequences reverse complementary to the ribosome RNA. Okay? And then they mix these beads with the total RNA. And then by mixing that, then you pull away all the beads and the attached sequences that are that will be ribosome RNA sequences. And then for the remainder <coughs> will be you know, non-ribosome RNA sequences <coughs> you want to sequence. Right? That's essentially the idea. So what you can get is from the company that sell you these beads. Uh, there are different names. One is called Rival Zero, they call Rival Minus. There are different companies, different names. There are actually even more, more companies saying uh, this type of reagent. Right. So then you just sequence, just keep the remainder right, of, of the RNA, and get rid of the beads and the attached RNA. Right. So that, that's essentially how you do it. And once you have the remainder RNA, you just follow the conventional protocol, right? You fragment the RNA, you make the first strand CDA, you make the second strand CDA, and then you, you ligate with, uh, with adapters, right? That's, that's how you do it. Right, so this, you know, this is perfectly fine. In fact, to me, one of the major problems with this is that you know, this kit is actually not cheap uh, compared to the RNC uh, kit itself, right? Because typically nowadays, the RNC kit is probably somewhere between $30 to $50 per kit to make RNC library. But this kit itself is cost even more. It's about like fifty or sixty dollars per kit. But what it does is really really minimal. So instead I prefer uh, this type of approach called RNS H based protocol. The idea in a way is similar because you know you, we all want to get rid of the ribosome RNA. Another thing I forgot to mention is that in the ribosome RNA uh, is very abundant. I said more than ninety five percent of the total RNA is ribosome RNA. But if you think about your transcriptome, the space, in terms of the space, how many bases, the ribosome RNA, typically we're talking about humans, we're talking about maybe 16 KB of sequences, right? So that means these 16 KB sequences have tons of copies, right, in the transcriptome. That's why you have 95% of the mass, total mass, being ribosome RNAs. But in terms of the space, it's actually very small. You don't have many ribosome RNA genes. You only, in total, you only have 16 KB. That's, that's why these companies can develop these beads coated with DNA sequences, reverse complementary to ribosome RNA sequences, right? Because you actually don't have to synthesize many different oligos. You know, we're talking about maybe not 1,000 oligos, which is very doable nowadays. 
it costs, let's say, thousand dollars or even around thousand dollars to synthesize these oligos. You know, you can use these oligos many, many, many times, right? So the cost is like zero, almost, right? So the idea here is actually very similar, but instead of sort of messing up with bees, so so you you have so that's instead of the total RA, the red one is Rapsom RA, the the blue one is the sequence that the non Rapsom RA one sequence, right? So the idea is kind of similar. You know, rather than using bees, you mix with some DNA oligos that are reverse complementary to Rapsom RAs. So again, you're we're talking about a few hundred. Uh, oligos uh, you need to synthesize to target each one of the ribosome RNA genes, okay? And once you have this sort of, then you of course you want them to anneal, the, the total RNA will be annealed with this oligo pool, and then only the ribosome RNA will be annealed to the oligos, right? So once you have this RNA-DNA hybrid, we know there's a, there's a cool enzyme called RN, RNSH, right? That was specifically digest the RNA in this mRNA in this RNA DNA hybrid uh, context. Right? That's sort of feature of RNH. And then you be, by doing that, you basically get rid of uh, all the ribosome RNA sequences right, in your pool, and you have the remainder, which is non ribosome RNA. Right? And then you just do the whatever protocol. You, and of course, you can also try to use DNA to get rid of the DNA oligo, uh, but that's sort of minor. And then, of course, you only have this, you know, some RA, depleted RA, so that you can make uh, whatever libraries uh, you want to make. Right? You can still fragment it, make first strand CDNA uh, with random hexamer, and then make double strand CDNA, and then make library. Right? So it's it's very very straightforward, right? Right. So the reason I prefer this is that if you really want to, if you depend on how many samples you have, right? But if you really want to do that, you actually can even synthesize, you know, just buy oligos from IDT. Right. In my lab, we actually have these oligos from IDT. It will probably cost you maybe five, six hundred dollars to buy these oligos in the first place. But once you have it, it's almost like an unlimited resource, right? Because you know, IDT will give you 25 uh, nanomole, right? Something like that, of, of oligo, per oligo, right? So it's, it's a ton. It's just, you have to understand our IDT gives you a lot of material uh, because you know, oligo synthesis is just so cheap. Uh, right, so. So then, you know, all you have to buy is just some sort of RSH enzyme, which is also very cheap. So, so if you really think about the reagent cost, it's about 50, 50 cents or less uh, per, per sample, not $50 or $60, as they say. But anyway, that, that's minor. You, know, you, you may not have to worry about it uh, in terms of cost. And, but, but another reason, I think you know, you, there are some comparisons. People compare this method with the rival zero, mark rival ma minus method, this method is at least equally good, or even better. All right, so I do want to give you a few sort of recommendations when you come to do uh, RNA sequencing. So, so, of course, you know, typically, in general, the more RNA you have to start with, the better it is, right? Because, you know, remember, I told you that when you make RNA seq libraries, in the old days, well, not old days, you know, eight years ago, right, when this RNA seq just came out, People typically use at least uh, like 10 micrograms of total RNA to make RNA-seq library. Right? That's sort of, if you read some of the old literature, that's how people do it. And then maybe later they shift to five micrograms, and then later one microgram. And then in recent years, you know, people are talking more about 100 nanograms. There are a lot of protocols, kits that can do that. Of course, if you really want to push harder, single cell, you can even use a very tiny amount of material. But that's not something uh, we want to focus on here. But just regular like, RNA sequencing, you get RNA from your cells, from your tissues, you can easily get you know, you know, the amount of RNA in the range of 100 uh, nanograms. You know, that's a typical situation. But sometimes it can be difficult to get 10 micrograms of the total RNA. Okay? So the current protocols will, e will usually allow you to handle 100 nanograms of the total RNA. Yes. That's before ribosomal depletion? Total RNA, yeah. Okay. Before ribosomal RNA depletion. Right. If, if, if it's after, that's, that's a different picture. Yeah, that would be much harder. This is the total RNA. Right, and then, of course, by the way, there are many different ways of doing it. You know, don't take this 100% with you because your application may not fit into this. I'm just saying, if you've never done it before, you don't care what to do, you just want to see what 
what would be the easiest, what would be the sort of common practice, that's the recommendation. Okay? So then typically, maybe the first time it's just easier to use poly oligo DT Bs to enrich poly A plus RA. Now, although there's some benefit to you know to use the RSH protocol or Rabo minus protocol so that you can get additional RA other than poly A plus RA. Uh, but because of poly A uh, plus enrichment, this oligo DT approach is just so conventional, so robust, uh, it may work much better. There's just most of the papers uh, are done that way, right? So it might be just easier, it may be just sufficient for you because you may not care about other like poly minus RA uh, species at all, right? So you may want to just choose that, but if you do care about some other like, non poly plus RA, that might be a good protocol. And, and by the way, this RSH protocol is also commercially available you know, through uh, NEB and uh, Kappa, uh, the companies that sell these reagents. All right, so, so then you, once you have you remove this, you either you reach for poly plus RA or you remove the Repsom RA, and you want to sequence RA. So there are different kits uh, to do that, uh, but I will probably recommend a few companies. Obviously, Illumina, if you look at the literature, most people use Illumina because they sell sequencer. People also assume they have better reagent to make libraries, uh, which is partially true. Uh, I, I, I would say and it's, you know, the reagents from other companies are at least equally good, but if you then consider the cost, it's actually better. Uh, it's actually much better. Uh, the quality, I don't see a difference in my hands. Uh, I'm not trying to, I have no financial <laughs> interest behind any of these companies, but just, just you know. Uh, right, so, so these companies, it just sell a kit, you know, nowadays the kit, like I said, it's only 30 to $50 uh, per reaction. It's really robust, you know. When I first started my lab, we actually buy you know, the primaries, you know, the ligase, everything to assemble the kit. You know, there are just many things uh, you can imagine because there are just so many steps. Uh, but now, you know, we feel it's much easier. Even for new people, people making the RSIC library the first time, usually it works, uh, and it's my lab. So, so don't panic. It's actually pretty, pretty standard. It's not, it's not, you know, rock science, I, I think. Right, so a few tips that I think actually are very important, number two. One is that you know, when you make RSIC libraries, I mean, if you just follow the conventional protocol, you probably often see something in the, because in the very end of the protocol, you have this fragments, double strand CDN fragments, you ligate with adapters, right? And then in the very end, you need to do some PCR to amp amplify your final library, right? You know, because the ligation product may not be sufficient because it's a small amount. You want to amplify that library before you send your sample for someone for sequencing, right? So during that PCR step to amplify that final library, uh, in the protocol, if you read, often what it says is that try to do like eight to 15 cycles of PCR, maybe 10 to 15 cycles of PCR. If some of you have done it, that's probably usually what, what it says, right? Which is probably okay, but then maybe some of you will wonder, should I do eight or 15? That's actually quite different. Right, so what do you mean, right? Um, so to eliminate the, the guesswork, what I recommend is to do qPCR, to do real-time PCR, because real-time PCR does tell you how much DNA you amplify, right, at every step. You should be able to tell at A cycles, do you have sufficient amount of material amplified? Or you have to go a little bit further, a few more cycles, to get more material, right? So by doing that, it's super easy. So all you have to do is just sort of spike in some, uh, some uh, you know, cyber green in your PCR. I guess you all done some sort of real-time PCR. But if you haven't, it's super easy. Right, so by doing that, it's, it, it sounds very trivial, but I actually think it's very important. Because in the model, I probably analyzed thousands of RNC libraries. You will be surprised how bad the quality of the of vast majority of the RNC library is. Right. The way I, the reason I say this is just because, you know, think about the RNA-seq, right? You sequence these RNA, you make fragments, you, in the end, you're gonna map these reads into the genome and transfer tom, right? So, so ideally, you want to have these reads sort of uniquely mapped to different regions, and you want, you don't want to have the same different reads mapped to the same region, so called redundant read, right? So basically, you have multiple, and as you have 100 reads, they map exactly to the same region. That's probably not a good sign, right? Because remember, when you fragment RA, it's, it's pretty random, right? 
So you, if you really want to have a good representation of your library, you should have R, the reads also kind of staggering along the transcriptome or the genome, right? So you have 100 reads or even thousands of reads all kind of stacked on each other, identical, mapped to the same region in the, in the transcriptome. That would suggest that you actually have a lot of PCR duplications. You know, basically, during PCR, we know if you start with one single molecule, you can make hundreds, thousands, millions of molecules of the same type. That's the sort of the beauty of PCR, right? Of course, PCR does that. But if you if but sequencing in a way is just a random sampling, right? You have many many molecules you want to sequence, right? But sequence are what only gives you something like a millions or hundred million reads, right? Which sounds a lot, but still compared to the number of molecules you kind of spike into the sequencer, that's a small sampling, right? By the sequencer. So if the sequencer after that sampling tells you you have hundred reads actually from the same region. That already suggests your library is pretty bad because your library doesn't represent the full uh, landscape of the transcriptome, right? Because if it does, if you random sample and let's say you have a transcriptome of 30 or 50 megabits, right, you have 20 million reads, you should have a lot of reads sort of mapped to unique regions, different regions in the transcriptome. You shouldn't have 100 reads all mapped to the identical region. That, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right? So, 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 so then when you analyze the current RNA-seq data, you'll find often, I would say most of the RNA-seq libraries, the duplicate read, so-called, is the duplicate read, the rate of duplicate read is super high. It's often more than 60%. Sometimes you'll see 90%. That's, that's really bad, right? So that means 90% of the reads are actually sort of redundant to each other in, in, in some ways, right? So of course, it's hard to, to, to have like zero percent. I, mean, I think a better library is that you will make is should be like 20, 30 percent uh, roughly, right? So, <clears throat> so the reason I think many of the libraries, you know, you know, people in many of the libraries, people have so many redundant reads is just because they have duplicate reads, and the the best way to create these duplicate reads is this last step of PCR, right? Because Trust me, if you amplify your library with 10 more cycles, you're going to have a lot more duplicate reads. That's one reason. Of course, another reason is just because, you know, during this, the reason, you know, remember, the RNA protocol has 30, 40 different steps. Even if you have, you know, 95% recovery of the material at each step, you may be losing a ton of material, right? Right, because 95% to the that's that's a tiny number. You can you can probably get that right. So that so that's something you have to remember because RNA seq is a long protocol. You know, even if you start with ten microgram, in the end, your library may not may not be able to represent the molecules from ten microgram of material because you're just losing too much along the way, right? Well, by the way, that's actually the reason. Along the years, people can move from ten microgram the starting material with ten microgram of total RNA to hundred nanograms of total RA, just because the recovery rate is much better. It's actually pretty incremental, but that's how, how things sort of evolved in the past eight years, right? But if you really look at the principle behind different protocols, you know, the protocol eight years ago versus the protocol now, I would say almost identical. There's no major difference, but there are some reagent differences just because they are, they're just more efficient to, to recover the material. But anyways, so that also means the number of cycles you will have to use in this last step to amplify your material is actually very indicative of the quality of your library, right? So this is actually a very important message, right? Particularly if you've never done it before. If you're making this library, use my protocol in the end, you use qPCR, you found out that you actually have to do 20, 30 cycles of PCR in order to, to, to see your qPCR curve shoots up. That, I would suggest you not to sequence your library at all, right? Because the, the large number of cycles you needed to make this library already suggests that your library is pretty bad because you're, you're having a small number of molecules starting material remaining in your library. That's the reason you need many cycles, right? But remember, the fewer molecules you remain from the original 100 nanogram or 10 microgram total RA, you know, the, the, the fewer molecules you have in the end, the worse library you're making, right? Because you're just not good at recovering 
the original RNA molecules you started with. Does, does that make sense? So that's, that's very important. So that's another reason I, I really highly recommend uh, doing the qPCR. Actually, not just for RNA-seq, for any sequencing library, I would say. Because it just avoids all the guessing work. You just, you, you, you would know by qPCR that you know, how many cycles you indeed will need. And also you avoid the over amplification to have the duplicate read, right? But more importantly, in a way, it tells you the quality of your library. You know, the rule of thumb is pretty much the fewer cycles you need, the better you're making the library. And that's, and that's, you have too much ribosome RNA contamination, right? Because that, that will be very deceiving, because you, your, the qPCR will not tell if that's ribosome RNA versus uh, the maturing RNA, right? But if you're doing a good job of removing the ribosome RNA, the fewer cycles you have will suggest the more ma starting material you have in your library to be amplified, right? Okay? Does that make sense? Y'all follow me? Yeah. All right. So that's tip number one, which I think is extremely important. The tip number two, which sounds even more trivial, but I also think it's extremely important, that is to quantify your library very well. Right? You have to, basically after this PCR, before you send some ship just delivered to someone for, for sequencing, you really have to know your, the quality of your library, right? So probably the most important thing is to, you have to know the quantity uh, of your library. You just have to have a right concentration of the library, right? The reason this is important, I briefly mentioned last time, is because when you do sequencing, right, so you, you, you basically, the sequencer will basically uh, ask you to, to kind of load the right amount of DNA into, into it, right, so that it will give you the optimal number of clusters or the reads, okay? If you shoot too little DNA into the sequencer, you're gonna have beautiful reads, but very few, fewer reads, okay? Because you just shoot not as much DNA into the sequencer. If you shoot too much DNA into the sequencer, you may have way more reads than the conventional number uh, the Illumina promises, but almost none of the reads will be useful because these reads are very super bad quality because they're just too close to each other, right? Because remember, in normal sequencing, you kind of require the, you know, basically generating the, the bridge PCR I mentioned earlier will generate many clusters. Each cluster will give rise uh, to, to the reads, to a, to a specific read, right? If the clusters are too close to each other by injecting too much DNA into the sequencer, then you can imagine they will interfere with each other, right? Because you're going to use ACGT two different, sorry, four different colored four four to distinguish the signal, right? When you do sequencing, you have ACGT uh, uh, sort of labeled with different uh, colored four fours, right? So obviously, you don't want to have the overlapping clusters. You know, the re if you shoot too much DNA, you will have overlapping clusters. You will have very low quality uh, uh, of the reads. Right, so that's why you, you want to have the sort of the right amount of the material sort of injected into the sequencer. But you're not injecting that yourself, but you need to tell people at the facility, here's the concentration of my, my material, right? That's very important, right? It's super trivial, but it, I really think it's very important. Because otherwise, you may be getting half of the number of reads you want to have, or you, you get nothing. Because just over, over uh, uh, dense. Right, so that's for the quantity, but the other thing is that you know, for RNA-seq, you know, often you know, I recommend you guys use a bioanalyzer because it's essentially a very sensitive gel, right, so that you can, you can visualize your product, right? Because you also want to ha have an idea whether you, you have sort of the, the right size range of the molecules you want to sequence, right? And remember, in the first step, when you fragment RNA, I, I recommend some conditions. So, so ideally, you have RNA fragments of the size between th three, vast majority of them, between fi 300 to 500 bases, right? Because that way, you, when you do sequencing, you sort of get the information, like non redundant information from both ends, right? But that's the time to check in the end, right? Because by, after that, because you make a library, you can sequence that. By running the binary, it will tell you the size distribution of your library. Right? So, so you want to make sure your size looks right, and also you want to pretty much, you are, you're looking for, uh, you're looking for, 
a knocker. <laughs> right, so you're pretty much looking for, you know, the binary will basically tell you the size, let's say 100, 200, 300, right? You're pretty much looking for like some curve like that, right? Oh, oh, thank you. So basically, this is like a size, let's say 100, 200, 300, 500, right? So pretty much you're looking for something, something like, like this. Right, so that's basically the sort of intensity of the of the size, right? Because basically it's like a gel. You know, this is basically most of most of the the, the DNA in the library are in this size range. Right? So if you start seeing like a jigsaws here, that's often an indication the library is actually not very good because you don't expect to see jigsaws, right? The jigsaw will suggest some molecules are enriched somehow in the library. Right? If you have something like like sometimes that's probably more common. You have something like like this, that's probably not good also, because you have something that's too short. Um, all right, so you all with me? All right, feel free to ask questions. All right, that's pretty much like regular RNA sequencing. And we have 30 more minutes, okay, right. all right. Do you guys need a break? Okay. Feel, feel free to walk away if you need a break, but I guess let's just continue because we only have uh, 30 more minutes. Yeah. Okay, so some of you are probably doing like small RNA sequencing, basically like a micro RNA, micro RNA sequencing. So, of course, there are, there are probably many different protocols also, <coughs> but uh, this is a protocol I, I personally prefer, uh, although I don't do that a lot in my own lab. Right, so, so the simple idea of the microarray sequencing is actually you, know, you have some microarray, five prime, three prime, <coughs> in, the, in the very beginning from Dave Bartels lab, they basically did a protocol so that you can add, it's like the ligation protocol I mentioned earlier, right? You, you add a vector, a common sequence, to the three prime end first, and then you add something to the five prime end, right? So you have like two common adapters, one to the three prime first, and then to the five prime, uh, and then pretty much you make a library, right? But the, the, the issue of the original protocol is that, you know, on paper, of course, you want a three command ligate to this adapter ligate, three command adapter ligate to the three command of the micron array, five command adapter ligate to the five command of the micron array. But in practice, you can imagine when you do this experiment, you know, your adapter concentration is way higher than the micron arrays, right? So in the end, in your library, in addition to this sort of desired product, okay, with micron RNA ligate with two different adapters, you have a ton of, ton of adapter, adapter ligation product because these things are just so, so abundant, right? Because that's how you kind of drive the ligation. You, need, you want to use a lot of adapters. And sort of molecular biology ligation, right? You want to have more adapter sequence, right? So that it drives the, the ligation reaction to the, to the completion. So that's a real problem because micron RNAs are pretty small, right? So then you, know, you have basically, you, know, you can imagine in the end you have, a, you have a desired band that is a little bit larger than the adapter, adapter fragments, right? So you really have to do a good job to get rid of adapter, adapter ligation. Of course, you can do job size selection and things like that. But it's, it's not trivial because, uh, you, know, you know, these are pretty small. Often you have to run a page gel because you need better resolution and the average gel will not be sufficient. It's just, you know, a, Becoming quite tedious, although it, it totally works. Right? But what I like about this protocol, actually, developed by my, my friend Francois uh, Ligner, um, who's now a millionaire, by the way, because he, he moved on to find a company, but that was sold for, to another company for $100 million. So he's smart to come up with some ideas <laughs> for, for new methods. That's essentially what other companies were doing. But anyway, that's a uh, side cut. Right, so what he did was something pretty smart, clever. Uh, I think that method was later adopted by Illumina. I think that's what Illumina does now. Right, so what he does is that, of course, the first step, you still ligate with adapter to the three prime end of the micron RNA, okay? So then before, in, in general, in, in the past, what people usually do is just to ligate with five prime adapter right away, right? But instead, what friends would design was to basically add this sort of RT primer, so this is five prime, three prime, you add this five prime, three prime adapter, which eventually you will have to use because you want to use that for the RT, right? You want to do reverse transcription to copy the micron RNA. 
right? Because eventually that's sort of the original protocol too, right? Eventually you have to use this adapter, uh, sorry, use this primer as a, as a RT, as a primer for the reverse transcription, right? But what he did was to add that before you ligate with this five prime adapter, okay? So by doing that, you kind of, you know, what I show here is just this, right? But you can also imagine there are a lot of three prime adapters that are just floating around not being able to ligate it to the micron array, right? So these floating around three prime adapters will also be annealed to this guy, this primer, right? Because they're reverse complementary to each other. And that sort of double stranded DNA, in a way, will prevent the ligation, because this is sort of some sort of single stranded RNA DNA ligation, this double stranded DNA will not be able to ligate it to the five prime end of the adapter, right? So in the sequencing business, basically there are just a lot of small tricks that become super useful, just like the Inma bridge PCR, as I mentioned earlier. Right? So how simple is that? But that became probably the, the key point of Inumina sort of that becomes dominant uh, in the field right? compared to some other methods like you know, solid, for example, they use uh, emulsion PCR, I, I mentioned last time. Right? Uh, so these simple things, also emulsion PCR in, on paper, would be a beautiful method because actually it was published in PNS. Bridge PCR was never really published because that's just too simple to be published, uh, right? But in business and technology, you really want to have something simple and easy, right? Not complicated, right? But the same thing happens here, right? It's so simple, right? So once you have that, you don't have the adapter adapter ligation anymore, right? So then this guy can serve as a as a primer for the RT, right? Because it just sits there, right? But you don't add RT at this step, yeah. After after this ligation, and then you make uh, you make this uh, uh, basically copy, which is CDN, the copy of the micron, right? and then of course you can try to make double stranded, and then and then you can just add some common sequences. That's your sequencing primer, right? As you know, how how simple is that? Right? So if you really get these reagents, actually your R, if you're working on micron array. The cost of sequencing mi micron arrays is just so, so low, right? Because you don't have many micron arrays. You're dealing with a thousand micron arrays. Many of them are, are not even expressed, right? So it's actually, you, you don't need a lot of sequencing to, to deal with micron array. But when you sequence with MRA, actually, you often need 20, 30, 50, sometimes 100 million reads, right? But for micron array, you only need maybe a couple million reads. Is so there a specific reason why you started with three prime instead of four digit matter? Right. So Right, so in this, the, the reason you start with three command is because you want to like it, this, you, you want to do RT from five prime to three prime, right? So that, that's how you, you do that, right? Because you want to annul that to here, yeah. All right, so, right, so another thing, you know, maybe I can jump here a little bit. So, yeah, so RNA sequencing, you know, is, is very powerful. But I do want to emphasize that doesn't solve all the problems. There actually are a lot of caveats in the current protocols uh, when we think about RNA sequencing. The first is that you know, when we think, think about RNA sequencing, you know, you remember most of the protocols would pretty much have to fragment the RNA first, right? So that means we're not going to appreciate the, the, the full length of the CDN, right? You're not getting information from the very beginning to the end of the transcripts, right? Because you really have to fragment it, and also the sequencing relay is pretty short. You know, in Umla, we're talking about 100 base pairs you know, from each end, although some applications can go longer. Uh, but overall, it's, it's pretty pretty short. And the, the long read uh, sequencing uh, is still uh, quite challenging. And of course, another reason is that you know, R is very dynamic, unlike DNA sequencing, genome sequencing, right? Because when you do genome sequencing, every cell, you know, you have two copies of, of your genome, right? And you know, and pretty much you have sort of equal representation of different bits of the genome when you try to make a library, right? So everything should be the same abundance uh, from the genome, right? So the rest, of course, you have some technical issues, some some regions may be more sequenceable than others, uh, you know, for example, the GC content, stuff like that. But for RNA sequencing on top of that, the real sort of 
challenge is that the RNA is way more dynamic, right? Because some of the transcripts could be, you know, in a cell you can have like one million or even ten million different copies of that gene, but many of the genes may not be expressed, or maybe expressed with one copy, right? Or maybe you know half a copy on average, you know, things like that. Uh, <coughs> and uh, of course, uh, sometimes uh, that makes it very difficult to find some of the rare transcripts, and also. Uh, we're not getting into some of the biology here. Sometimes people care about the allele-specific expression because you have, when you signal RNA or genome, you have two different alleles, paternal allele, maternal allele, right? Sometimes you want to appreciate the expression differences between these two different alleles, right? So you have some genetic markers like a SNPs. You could be able to, uh, you know, distinguish the ratio, right? Identify, the, find, find out the ratio between these two different alleles, right? But some of them could be biologically relevant, uh, but if the expression is very different from genes to genes, you may not have basically sufficient copies uh, to quantify the, the allelic ratio. You know, there are some approaches to that. You can try to target the target RNA sequencing. You can try to normalize uh, the libraries so that you can basically try to have equal number of reads for, for different genes, regardless of the gene expression levels. So we're not getting into that. <coughs> And, <coughs> and of course, uh, you know, you've probably all heard of the single cell sequencing. You know, one of the reasons this is becoming so popular is just because you know, when you deal with RNA sequencing from you know, a population of cells or a specific tissue, uh, that's obviously derived from many, many different cells, millions or hundreds of millions, right? That's essentially an ensemble of everything. Uh, but some of the <coughs> applications, you really want to appreciate uh, the kind of the individual differences uh, between different cells. But now, of course, you know, single cell RNA sequencing is becoming uh, feasible. Uh, of course, the protocol is becoming even more complicated because you know it's becoming even more important to capture the tiny bits of the information. But the theory, I would say, is pretty much the same, right? Just like I was telling you, right, in the beginning, people use 10 micrograms of total RNA to make RNA-seq library, but now you can do 100 nanograms, right? So single cell RNA-seq is pretty much pushing you to, to dealing with something like a picogram uh, of material. Uh, so, so of course, there, there are trade-offs of that. You know, you, you're going to lose a lot of information, but, but still, you know, for some applications, it will be uh, very useful. Um, right, so, so I do want to go back and, and talk a little bit more about the, the, the full-length transcripts, uh, how people deal with that. Right. So, right. So, so let's say, uh, take this uh, example, right? So, th th here's here are a few transcripts derived from the same gene, right? So, let's say there are the three different conditions. So, you can imagine uh, different scenarios. In this gene, there are two different, like alternative spliced axons, right? The red and blue, right? But maybe in this under this condition, you have this. Oh, you know, some transcripts only have this isoform, but some only have this blue isoform. But some of them, if, if, uh, under this condition, you may have these two isoforms, you know, uh, two different sort of alternative splicing events located within the same transcripts, but this is more like a random, right? Any, any situation can happen, right? So in a conventional sort of either micro microarray, the microarray, there are some ways to appreciate the, 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 uh, the splicing. You can basically run pr probes, you know, at the rat region or the nearby the rat region. Anyways, the, the Microarrays or the, the conventional RNA sequencing, the short read RNA sequencing, what you're going to do, you're going to basically get reads, you know, spanning this blue axon or the red axon. So then you, you, you will not be able to distinguish these three situations, right? Because it doesn't matter which condition it is, you'll always get you know, some reads, you know, covering the red, right? Red. <coughs> and some reads that will cover the blue, right? And you basically get the same type of reads, right? But in reality, this could be biologically important, right? Because you know these are different transcripts we all see here, right? But in the sequencing data, you get the same information. So that sometimes can be can be a concern. That indeed, you know, I think will be a, will be a sort of the next frontier if you think about uh, the RNA sequencing. You know, we're we're not necessarily appreciating the full length transcript uh, Instead, we're often just taking sort of the snapshots uh, of different parts of the gene and try to map that to the gene and try to sort of uh, assemble the information. Uh, but sometimes uh, 
you know, if you have a situation like that, you cannot really assemble the, the entire transcript on. So what you really want is to have sort of, sort of non-resequencing uh, scheme so that you can really can appreciate the, the real situation. There are different ways of doing it. Uh, you know, you probably heard of there's a company actually in this area, 10 minutes drive from here, for, called Pacific uh, Biosciences PacBio. So what PacBio can deliver is uh, the full length, the, 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 the longer reads. Uh, so basically, the read length can, you know, beginning is like a couple of KB, but now it's probably tens of KBs long. You can have very long reads, but the the, the drawback of this approach is that you know the error rate is very very high. And also the throughput is very, very low. You know, we're talking about you know, much fewer reads. You know, normally we'll either give you hundreds of millions of reads, right? But for, for PacBio, we're talking about, I haven't followed that very closely, but in the very beginning it was like 50,000. And nowadays it's probably, it's still easier than that, a million reads, right? So you don't have many, as many reads as you will get from Nuna, right? So that means, you know, you, for R sequencing, the number of reads is very important, right? Because you have so many copies, right? If you, if you know, needs 20 million reads, you know, you, that, there's a reason for that. You really have to have a lot of reads to cover the 50 megabase transcript. Right? Uh, and of course, you know, sometimes it can be very difficult to have to, have to really you know, reconstruct the full length CDN, as we kind of mentioned before. Right? In order to sequence the full length CDN, you have to make one first. But that may, may be challenging as well. Right. So. So there's one method actually developed here in Mike Snyder's lab uh, by a former postdoc, uh, Hagen Kjellgner. Uh, they published a few years ago, which is actually pretty clever. But the idea is kind of similar to what people use in like genome, uh, you know, whole genome haplotyping assays, right? So the idea is that, right, so, so for genome haplotyping, some of you may be familiar, but just very briefly, right, so you have, let's say you have, you know, genome, you have maternal copies and um, paternal copies, right? So you really want to, Distinguish these two different copies, right? So you may have SNPs on different copies, uh, different maternal or uh, paternal, right? So if you want to have short reads, you actually cannot tell whether these two mutations or, or SNPs are linked to each other, right? Right? Because you only have sort of a snapshot of one region on it. It's actually the same problem here, right? So what people people have developed many different methods, but a popular method was basically to dilute the starting material. Let's say you you, you make up some libraries. Let's say you have some longer reads that will cover both regions, okay? Some longer reads, uh, some longer DNA fragments to start with. And the, the way you do it, you kind of dilute the fragment, uh, th this library, into many, many sub pools, okay? So then in each pool, you may have thousands or thousands of molecules, right, per pool. So then, by chance, if you only have thousand molecules in that pool, by chance, you're not going to have both maternal and paternal copies from the same gene, right? Because there's, you know, we're talking three gigabits. You only have, if you random sample, you know, three gigabits, you know, you only have thousand copies in that well, in that particular sub pool, you're not gonna have the same thing interfering with each other, right? So then by doing that, if you see, then you just make libraries for each one of the sub pools. If you see some variation, then you will know oh, that should derive, should be derived from the same uh, allele, right? Either the maternal copy or the paternal copy. Right, so that's sort of the idea. You know, sometimes that's why I think, you know, for student and postdoc, you know, although you may feel I'm just a user of the technology, uh, but I would say this technology is truly derived from something that was published a few years ago for DNA, for genome, haplotyping process, right? Right, so the same idea, right? So let's just quickly go through it. So basically, you, you still make the CDA, and then you, you, you basically divide them into many, many different pools, right? Uh, you have, pools of a few single-stranded CDNA molecules per well, right? And then you make the double-stranded CDNA uh, per well. And then you just, you know, for each one of the libraries, just, just sequence it, right? Because by chance, you're not going to have the same, uh, same molecules uh, uh, from derived from the same gene, right? Because you don't have many copies, uh, uh, you don't have many molecules per well to start with, right? So by having that, so, so that, that way, you, you basically still make the, the conventional RNA-seq library but you just have to make many, many, many libraries so that you kind of assemble all the information together. That's how, how you do it. All right. Um, let's jump over this. Right. So, okay. So we're almost done. Okay. So that's pretty much, you know, the conventional RNA sequencing, you know, and the microRNA sequencing, and the larvae sequencing. But there are a few other things I don't know whether you guys work on. You know, 
they're not called RNA sequencing at all, but I would say they're sort of derived from RNA sequencing because essentially you're sequencing the RNA fragments, right? So two, there are many different applications, but two things are, that are probably more commonly used. One is called ClipSeq. Essentially, you're trying to identify the RNA fragments uh, that are bound by a particular RNA binding protein of interest. Right? So let's say if you study RNA binding protein, you want to see where it binds in the RNA. Right? So you can use this method called cross-linking immunoprecipitation sequencing called ClipSeq. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. And then the other way is, is the, the other is called Rapsom RNA sequence, Rapsom profiling, we'll get to that in a second. Right. right. So for the ClipSeq, essentially it's sort of analogous to the ChipSeq. Many of you are probably more familiar with it, right? The ChIP-seq basically are trying to find the binding size of transcription factors in a DNA, right? right? So you have the transcription factor that will bind to some fragment of DNA, right? You just sort of cross-link that DNA and protein interaction, and you sort of digest everything away, and then that DNA that's bound by transcription factor will not be digested away, and then you can sort of sequence that piece, right, on it. Right, the RNA, the ClipSeq is essentially the, you know, the same version, but for RNA and protein interaction, right? So in this case, it's not a transcription factor, it's rather it's RNA binding protein, right? It's not DNA, rather, rather it's the, the RNA, right? So you basically can, you can pull down, use antibody uh, to the RNA binding protein to pull down the RNA fragments that are specifically bound to the particular RNA binding protein of interest, right? So then just make libraries to, to sequence uh, these RNA fragments. So it, it's a long program. I don't, I don't think I want to spend too much time on the details. Right? But essentially, uh, you kind of cross-link the RNA, and then and you you kind of uh, you, you 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 basically specifically put on uh, the RNA fragments that are that are bound to this particular RNA binding protein. In this case, called FOX2, and then you know run a gel, you kind of separate that. It's, it's a pretty uh, tedious protocol, I have to say. And get rid of the RNA, uh, get get rid of the protein, and then. You, you basically try to make an RNA sequencing library from this sort of small amount of material. So essentially, you're dealing with how to make a sequencing library from very small amount of material, right? Because remember, for R regular conventional RNA sequencing, you start with the full transcriptome. You want to sequence every bit, right? Except the Roxham RNA. Right? That's the information you want to capture. So that's good because you basically you, you're not picky, right? Where you want to sequence, you want to sequence everything. So that means you actually have a lot more material to play with in your library preparation. Library uh, preparation, but here you don't want to sequence everything. You only want to sequence the fragments that are bound by that particular RNA binding protein, right? Well, that's a, that's a goal. But it also kind of delivers this big challenge because. You don't have many RNA fragments. You don't have the whole transcriptome bound by the RNA binding protein. Now, even for RNA binding protein that binds everywhere, it's only a tiny fraction of the transcriptome, right? Which is trivial, but technically this becomes a real issue because, so let's say if if 0.1 percent of the transcriptome is bound by a particular RNA binding protein, that means your starting point material is becoming 0.1 percent of your starting material, right? It's not 100 nanograms anymore, right? It's become, it's becoming 100 picograms. So all of a sudden, you have to deal with how to make RNC library from 100 picograms of material. In theory, it should all work, but once you deal with you know, this small amount of material, you, you'll, you'll start appreciating this can be a real challenging problem. That's why even now, I would say, most of the ClipSeq protocols are, are just not super, uh, super efficient. You know, people often have different results. It's not very producible and stuff like that. So then, you know, people develop all kinds of variables. <laughs> this uh, Clip protocol is called iClip. I'm not going to go into details. Uh, and also, there's something called ParClip. Uh, but essentially, the, the goal is very, very similar. <coughs> right. So the last thing I want to mention is ribosome RNA uh, profiling. Right. So as you see, you know, when an RNA is mature RNA is exported to the cytosol. You know, the ribosome will jump on and then will will translate the you know the into proteins. <coughs> so of course, you know, if you really want to appreciate a protein, uh, people do mass spec. But you know, the ribosome profile is nice because you know the goal is basically they want to see where in the transcriptome, in the mature mRNA, uh, are sort of actively translated, right? So that it's not a mass spec, 
but it's sort of the proxy to, to mass spec, but in a very efficient way because you can sequence it, right? Mass spec protein sequencing is just so tedious and hard and expensive, right? Right. So then the idea is that you know you have this ribosome bound to some RNA, right? So you can you can basically you know digest anything that's not the, digest the RNA that is not bound by the ribosome, and then you only have this very short fragment. We're talking 20, 30 nucleotide uh, bases uh, that are protected by the uh, ribosome, right? So people in the old, old days called ribosome footprinting, right? So it's like a sort of protected RNA fragments by the ribosome, but, but these RNA fragments are essentially being actively translated, right? So it's, again, it's, you're not measuring the protein, but it's, it's, it's getting close. So it's very useful information rather than just you know, appreciating the abundance of the RNA, you also try to get some information you know, whether that RNA is, is actively uh, being translated. Right? So that, that, that can be very useful information sometimes. So it's very powerful. Uh, this method was uh, initially developed by, uh, uh, by Johnson and Whiten's group at UCSF. Right? So once you have these fragments, and then of course you can make libraries, and essentially you're, you're just dealing with uh, small RNA fragments. All right, so that's all I want to say. Just for a quick recap, you know, we have covered you know, the regular RNA-seq, the poly plus, and total RNA by removing the ribosome RNA. Now, we also talk about the strand-specific RNA. If there's anything you need to remember today, I think that's probably the most important part because that's what I assume most of you care about you know, in, your, in, your, in your labs. But some of you may care about the small RNA sequencing, but even if you don't care now, you may care later because obviously there are a lot of interest research in, in small RNA. And the CRIPSIC uh, and other variables, the ribosome RNA, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how many of you are interested in it, but I do feel these are actually becoming very important techniques. And yeah, that's it. There are just a few references if you want to read a little more about uh, these methods. If you have specific questions, you feel free to either ask now or send email. All right, so also, if you guys have feedbacks, you know, feel free to send me an email or send Chris an uh, email. Because uh, we, this is the first time uh, we're doing this for the land library through the, the post office because we, we realize there's a huge need demand from post office. Some of you probably know I, I run a mini course on sequencing. That's a three week mini course with nine different actors. Uh, for that course, you know, we often, in the past few years, we often have 90 post offs we want to audit. Uh, in the end, we were able to double the size of the class, uh, the size of 30 for graduate students. But in, the end, in the end, we often do 60, 30 graduate students and 30 postdocs, but still we couldn't satisfy uh, all the postdocs. So I assume most of you are, are postdocs here. Uh, so that's why you know, when, when Len and I were approaching, I thought maybe, it, maybe it's a good idea. Uh, like it's short and brief, so hopefully. Uh, I know it, it can be very challenging to satisfy all because you probably all come with different needs. So I'm not sure how useful this is. Uh, so that's why I think having some feedbacks uh, could be very useful in, in the long run. Because if it's very useful, of course we can consider doing that again for the name library. But if it's not helpful, obviously I'm happy not to do it either. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
cortex is high, correct? Right, you probably over amplify a little bit, only my so guess. So my relaxed time should be yeah, 12? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, that's okay. why I recommend real time PCR, you don't have to yeah. guess. Yeah, but right now, um, real time PCR will tell you so where you when to stop. Yeah. So usually, for example, sending the sequence, which facility is really good? Oh, my lab, we call on a next one of the sequencing machines, because it's just so fast. Okay. Uh, we use yeah. NXX 500, um, but in our, in our department, we have a center for uh, genomics and personalized medicine. Oh. So the person running that, you can give samples yeah. to that okay. to that person called the is person is uh, It's someone, yeah, if you, Snyder Lab is doing it, but the one, the person who takes the samples uh -huh. here on campus here, yeah. not at Porter Drive, that's oh. where the sequencers yes. are. Uh -huh. Uh, if someone could send me one, if you send me an email, I can forward you that information. So okay. she should be able to, she's a liaison person, oh, to take all the samples and deliver okay. to Porter Drive for you. Oh, right. I see. Yeah. Is campus they pick up? Uh, they, yeah, basically, anytime you can drop off your sample, but oh, I don't okay. know how often she goes there to Porter okay. to deliver I, the samples. Yeah. I see, okay. Yeah. Now, what's, what's the facility's name called? The Center for Genomics and Personalized Medicine. Okay. Sequencing facility. That. I will search that. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. There's actually very good questions. One is that um, I'm trying to isolate RNA from like platelets, so it is like picogram. Right. Yeah. Does it make sense in that context to even do RNA depletion? Right. So yeah, where yeah. Because so okay. I didn't get into that because that's actually becoming more advanced users. Yeah. I didn't get more into that. And so one protocol we my lab actually is trying, but we haven't really done much yet. There's a there's a company called, called Compact in this area. Mm -hmm. They have a they have a kit called Smart Sick. Is it is it the smarter the Jakarta? Smarter, yeah. 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 Okay. That's right, Jakarta yeah. is quite about Jakarta, yeah. that's right, yeah. That's a protocol I would recommend. They yeah. even have a protocol to remove Rapsomal RNA later. Right. I see. Right. So so typically people remove Rapsomal RNA first, right? Yeah. Which is fine in theory. But the problem is that once you remove the Rapsomal RNA, you're basically dealing with even yeah. smaller amount of material. You know, when you deal with very small material, that becomes a huge challenge because even pipetting can be a problem mm -hmm. because this DNA will stick to the wall yeah. because you only have picogram of material. Right? Right. So that's why they, the protocol, one of the protocols they have is that they don't remove Rapsom RNA first. Yeah. They take all of the RNA right. to make, to basically convert that into cDNA to make a library. Yeah. And then later, they have some proprietary method, which they don't reveal, they just sell some probes yeah. uh, to remove the, the DNA derived from the Rapsom So is that, that's not part of the kit though? It's part of the kit. It yeah. is part yeah. of the Jakarta? Yeah. Oh, right. I see. Okay. Yeah, it's, I think it's called Smart Sick uh, version 2, something like that. I see. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so it is inclusive, because when I was reading through the... I manual, think it's I inclusive, because my postdoc it, just talked to a sales rep just yeah. last week, because we're trying to try it. Because I've looked look into many different yeah. options, that's a lot.